So every Easter, I hear that Easter is just a celebration of the pagan deity Ishtar. Every Christmas, I hear the Christmas trees are pagan. And then throughout the year, I always get emails from people saying, hey, my friend told me that a lot of what we believe is actually comes from paganism, like when pagans converted under Constantine, that's where the Catholic Church developed. Or I know an atheist who says that Jesus never existed, the story of Jesus is ripped off from pagan mythology. So on today's episode, we're going to bust those myths. Welcome to the Council of Trent podcast. I'm your host, Catholic Answers apologist and speaker, Trent Horn. And on today's episode, I want to share with you an interview that I did on Keith Nestor's YouTube channel. Uh, Keith has a great YouTube channel. He also has a website, downtoearthministry.org, so be sure to go and check it out. And Keith asked me to come on his show to bust this Catholicism is actually pagan myth. So without further ado, here's my interview with Keith Nestor on Is the Catholic Church Pagan. Yeah, it's been just an honor to uh, to know that I was going to get a chance to to run through this stuff because this is one of those issues that I find that you know you don't find all the answers to this type of stuff in like your general introduction to Catholic apologetics. No, you don't. It, uh, they claim that Catholicism and Christianity are. Uh, pagan derivatives is something that is spread across a multitude of books. In my own books, I cover these various arguments in in different books. So in my book, Counterfeit Christs, I talk a lot about the idea that Christianity itself is based on pagan myth, uh, myths and other things like that. In my book, Hard Sayings, where I talk about Bible difficulties, I relate to some of the similarities between stories in the Old Testament and other ancient Mesopotamian accounts. And then when I talk about Catholicism in my books like Case for Catholicism or Why We're Catholic, I talk about the arguments Protestants sometimes make. So it has encouraged me to think I may write a book in the future. I've got like 20 of them in the hopper uh, on uh I thought about writing it just on Catholic conspiracy theories themselves. Ooh, and some of these pagan crazy. theories are, are in there. So maybe that will come to fruition one day. I, I remember where the first time I heard this argument, I was in high school and hanging out with one of my, one of my good friends who was not a Christian. And he was one of these guys that like to always have this sort of, you know, one upmanship on in arguments. And he was, oh, well, don't you really know? And, 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 you know, really, let me just give you the full story. And, you know, I grew up in the church, my dad was a pastor. So to me, you know, knowing about Jesus, knowing about God, it was just part of my life. But when I encountered this, this friend, he, I remember he handed me this book one day and it was a book called Christianity Before Christ. Right. And I'd never seen anything like, and he's like, well, don't you know, that everything that you believe about Jesus is really just recycled paganism. And it all was ripped off. You know, the church ripped this stuff off from these ancient religions. And then he had these weird names, you know, Zoroastrianism and Mithra and all this. And I was, I'd never heard that before. And I was blown away. And I didn't, I didn't know how to answer that. I, right. I was completely like at a loss because like in my youth group, we never talked about that kind of stuff, Trent. I know it's a shame. I feel like sometimes for youth groups and youth preparation, especially with middle school and high school students, we can turn it into a kind of glorified Sunday school as if all we are supposed to do here is tell the stories. And that's fine when children are little. Uh, I mean, I have a six and a four year old and I show them the Hanna-Barbera greatest story, greatest Bible stories of all time videos. And they're awesome, by the way. I, I hate I hate things like Veggie Tales and, and stuff like that. But uh, it's like it's epic. Like they get the guy from up Ed Asner to vo do the voice of Joshua. But they got these big name celebrities to do it. And I'm like, yeah, treat it with some respect. But I mean, say when the kids are little, we tell the stories. But as we grow older in our faith, even starting in junior high, we should be saying, and here's how we know the stories are true, or here's how we go deeper into the story to understand what is being expressed in different ways here. And so, yeah, when people say this, though, I will find something that, that's a bit ironic. Like you have a friend who tells you, and this happened to me too. When sure. I was in high school, a friend said, hey, watch this video, Zeitgeist. And oh, it's yeah. Got, yeah, and it's got the, the, the second, it's all about conspiracy theories. And part two is about how Jesus never existed. And so you have, where it's ironic, you have these people who will say, oh, I don't believe it just because it's in the Bible. But hey, look at this book or this video. And they believe everything that book or that video says uncritically 
while trying to claim that we are the gullible ones for following the Bible. Yet they pick something that they accept and just believe whatever it says without double checking the sources. Because if they did, they would see they've been misled. That, you know, Trent, that's one of the things that I've I've seen you do and, and heard you say so many times in your debates with people that to me is like one of the most critical foundational elements of apologetics is trying to, is, is being able to recognize when people are holding Catholicism or Christianity to a different standard than they do everything else. Right. And I found that like a lot of Protestants do that when it comes to, you know, we want to be so skeptical about the claims of Catholicism, but that same skeptic attitude they don't have when it comes to some of their own claims about Christianity. It's like selective skepticism. Right. Uh, and this is a subject for another book uh, I'm thinking about. Usually each day I try to write about uh, about 1,500 words, and I slot, I slot it into whatever book I think it would it would make do. So you get an in, in, interview of my my writing life. But I've noticed this, like Protestants will say, look at all the, the historical evidence for the, res the miracle of Christ's resurrection. And I'll say, okay, well, what about the evidence for these well-attested miracles related to the saints, like uh, the, the miracle at Fatima, which, which has really good... Now, I mean, I don't believe every story about every saint. Some of them we don't have really great historical evidence for, but some we've got really, really good evidence, like the miracle at Fatima. We have contemporary accounts. We don't even have that for the resurrection. And yet Protestants will say, oh, well, that's, that's this or that's that. And I, I have seen this double standard. This shows up with the the argument from paganism. If a pro, usually it's more Protestant fundamentalists will do this. Yeah, but they'll say, you know, okay, look, this the idea of the the Virgin Madonna. Like, there's you know, pic, pictures of Mary holding Jesus. Well, that's just like uh, Isis and Horus and all these other images of women and the the male savior child. That's just that's just paganism. And I would say, number one, images of mothers and children are a universal norm and reality. You would find people would venerate the source of life that we, we all had. But number two, if you're going to say, OK, I don't even marry in dogmas because there's these pagan cults that venerated women or, or female deities, then you're going to have to throw out the resurrection because what atheists will do is they'll say, hey, what about this God, this dying and rising God or that dying and rising God? So you're right, Keith, when Protestants attack Catholicism over alleged pagan parallels, they leave themselves open to being refuted by atheists who could do the exact same thing to them. So if there is, so then you either have to reject both or I would say, hey, your answers against the atheist who's trying to do this pagan parallel argument, a Catholic can offer the same thing if you're trying to make that against our doctrines. Yeah, I think I think that's huge. I mean, it goes back to the to the foundational idea of how why do we believe what we believe? Right. And why do we think that, you know, certain views, where do we where do we come up with our our ideas of what reality is? And I'm not trying I'm not talking like the matrix or something like that. I'm talking about like within when we talk about issues of faith, issues of revelation from God, you know, where, where we're coming from with this, we really, we have two fronts, you know, like you talked about, you have the atheist front on one side, and then you have the Protestant front on the other side. But really, at the end of the day, I would say that the Protestant has a lot more trouble because like you said, those those same arguments, they're going to have to turn that on themselves. But why, why do you think like this is a thing? Where does this, where do these claims even come from in the first place? And on what basis do, do people make these claims? It, there's a wide variety of them. But what's ironic about this, that the claim that Catholicism or Christianity are just recycled pagan ideas, these arguments themselves are recycled arguments. Mm. Uh, they're the same arguments that pop up. Like if you see somebody making this argument in 2021, you can find somebody... Uh, like Christianity Before Christ that you mentioned, John Jackson, those arguments go all the way back to the early 20th century. Uh, people like Remsburg and, and other people who, in the early 20th century, they were arguing, or late 19th, early 20th century, they were saying, hey, look, Christianity is purely derived from pagan mythology, and they tried to find all of these sorts of parallels. And human beings are kind of wired. You know, some of you will get into conspiracy theories. We try to find patterns because we want to make sense of the world. 
And so we think, okay, I found a, a pattern here and I found this pattern, but the problem is the patterns are superficial. So in 1961, there was a guy named Samuel Sandmel, and he published an article in the Journal for the Society of Biblical Literature, which is still a very large publication today. And he called this exercise parallelomania. And he was chiding people saying, hey, look, just because you think these two things are related, if they sound similar, it doesn't mean that they are. And in fact, this whole school of thought trying to say that Christianity is just a pagan religion, it died in the early 20th century. You don't find serious academics at universities or people with PhDs in the relevant subjects arguing for this, because as the 20th century progressed, scholarship came to rediscover the Jewish roots of Jesus, that understanding the New Testament, it's deeply rooted in Judaism. And Judaism was incredible, especially Second Temple Judaism, when Jesus lived, was incredibly hostile to pagan influences. To give you an example, uh, there was an incident in Jerusalem when blast when golden shields were erected in the city that had inscriptions to Caesar as a god. And the Jewish leaders considered this blasphemous to have these, these, in, these inscriptions glorifying the emperor as a deity in their city in these golden shields. And so they rioted and Pontius Pilate had to take them down to avert a huge riot. And that left him a bit on edge, which led to the predictable events that we read in the Gospels where Pilate kind of rolls over to the Jews that are attempting to start another riot. So if they're getting that worked up about that, you just couldn't imagine them saying, oh, our rabbi has been executed. Let's just now believe a bunch of pagan myths that, that we've detested our entire lives. It just simply doesn't make sense. Yeah, I've always wondered about that because at the at the core of that argument is this idea that what we believe as Christians must have happened, must have come much later than the events that are being described in the Gospels because— right. Like you said, you don't go from, I hate paganism, and I'm willing to die rather than pinch incense to Caesar, to all of a sudden now I'm mining these, you know, ancient pagan scrolls to create a new religion out of nothing that, you know, I'm trying to convert Jews into right? by, by telling them it's the fulfillment of, but I'm going to use all this pagan garbage that they would hate anyway. It just doesn't make any sense. No, it, it doesn't. And so that's an important element to consider when you're comparing these stories to try to say, OK, you should ask someone who says, oh, it's just ripped off of this or that. First, you should ask, OK, well, when did this happen? It would be one thing if Jesus died in you know, the, the 30s, the first century, and then the first proclamation of the resurrection was in like the year 120, like 100 years later. With most ancient figures, the first miracle accounts we get of them are much later, even centuries later. That's time for legend to kind of creep in. But the resurrection was proclaimed in, well, Paul's first letter to the Corinthians was written in the 50s. That's 20 years. When he describes the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15, he's passing on a creed, something he received from other people that has been dated to within five years of the resurrection. So there's just not enough time. So one thing to point out is, okay, where was the time for this dramatic overhaul for these beliefs to creep in? And then number two, we should be hesitant in trying to say, oh, Christianity, it's, it has absolutely nothing to do with, with paganism whatsoever. Well, you don't want to make that sweeping claim either, because as Christians, we believe it's okay to baptize pagan culture, to practice what Pope St. John Paul II called enculturation. So uh, to, let me give you an example here. Uh, this is something that Protestants sometimes, they've uh, some anti-Catholic works, they quote Cardinal John Henry Newman. And Newman says here, temples, incense, votive offerings, holy water, blessings of fields, sacerdotal vestments, like what priests wear, dot, 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 are all of pagan origin. And so these anti-Catholic writers in the early 20th century are like, see, even Cardinal Newman says that it's pagan. But if you go back to the original quote, where the ellipses are, the three dots, Newman says, and the ring in marriage. Because mm -hmm. Protestants also, like, like, you should ask somebody, why do you give your spouse a ring when you're married? Where is that in the Bible? It's not. That was an element that was first uh, promoted by the ancient Egyptians because they believed that the the uh, the vein that goes down your finger uh, on your ring finger goes all the way to your to your heart, and that the ring itself is an unending symbol. But we see there's nothing wrong with using that because it it, it is a symbol that is still it doesn't contradict the faith to say that marriage ought to be unending, at least in this life, uh, that it is something that is permanent, 
and bonds us to another person. So we, we that element. So we have to look, we have to point out a two pronged approach, I guess, show where the parallel arguments fall flat or where there is a parallel, but it's, it's trivial. We're baptizing something that's just a way of celebrating a, a common mystery or understanding of reality. So in the, in the, um, especially like I would call in the um, neo-Calvinist Protestant reformed world right now, right. Um, they have something that they refer to as redeeming the culture. OK, I don't know if mm -hmm. you've ever heard that terminology before, but when sure. I was I used to be a pastor and and a lot of the guys I would run around with were sort of in that world, you know, and they would it was it was huge. And that's what they what they described redeeming the culture was. It was more about met methodology than it was theology. They would say, OK, well, our churches need to look like things in the culture so that we can. Uh, redeem the culture. So they would take, you know, they would take music that was like music that's in the culture and they would try to take that. And it was, it was viewed as this really noble, innovative, um, creative way to preach the gospel to people was to say, look, we're going to take things that are familiar to this culture and we are going to co-opt them for the gospel and use them right. for ministry. And I kind of see where, you know, and everyone's like, yay, that's great. Good job. But when that's happened in histor in historical ways, like we're going to use the vestments or the th like, you know, like the wedding ring or whatever. Now we want to point our fingers at that and say, well, no, it's never OK to do that in the past, but it's OK for us to do it here in the present. Exactly. So to give you an example, the first uh, places where Christians worshipped communally, uh, they did worship in synagogues until they were kicked out of them. Uh, they would worship together in people's homes. So the first churches were house churches, and the pagans had temples, sometimes very opulent temples. But by the time Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire, then Christians were in a position to build their own temples. If, if the pagans can have these opulent temples, why shouldn't we have one to glorify God? In Rome, the pantheon, uh, pantheos, means all gods. It's a temple that was dedicated to all the gods. And then Christians uh, retrofitted it, built it, took it over to dedicate it to all of the holy ones of the true religion. Or, or to give you an example, in the 8th century, like people will say, oh, the, the Christmas tree. You know, that's just, just just pagan stuff, yada, yada. Well, no, its roots go all the way back in the, the, the 7th and 8th centuries to St. Boniface, the apostle to Germany, who cut down a tree that was being worshipped, saying, the tree you should worship is the tree of eternal life. And th although that's the farthest we get back. The Christmas tree probably has more of its roots in 18th, 19th century. But it's like, hey, instead of worshiping trees, a tree can be a symbol of ever everlasting life because it's an evergreen tree. And the lights point us to the light of Christ and they guide us. Once again, baptize, taking what is good in the culture that is at least not antithetical to the gospel and baptizing it that we've, we've done that for 2000 years. Yeah. And, and people are still doing it today, but right. You know, okay. So let's, let's talk for a second about some of these myths and some of these religions. I mean, do you, what do you, and I, what do you see when you look at some of these? Are there any similarities between what we believe and some of these? Like, what are some of the things that people are saying when they say Christianity right. is a recycled religion? What are some of the similarities? Well, some of the similarities they point out are similar in name only. So they're superficial. So if you take uh, so that that's one problem. The other problem is sometimes there are very specific similarities but the flow of the copying is in reverse. It's not Christianity copying paganism, it's paganism copying Christianity. So even example, Mithraism would be a good example of this. So Mithra or Mitra was a figure that was worshiped in Persia originally in, in what is now modern day Iran, before later in the second, uh, the first and second centuries after Christ, becoming an object of worship, especially among Roman centurions. Uh, so he's known for conquering the bull as like this cosmic savior figure. So some of the, the similarities are superficial. He, you know, you'll watch documentaries that say uh, Mithra was was born of a virgin, except no, Mithra was born, emerged fully grown from a rock. I mean, I guess a rock is a virgin in the most strained sense of the word. But you see, it's, it's superficial here. Or uh, here is Mithra with 12 disciples. Well, no, in the images, it's just Mithra with 12 figures. It's probably the Zodiac. It says nothing about, about disciples. And there's no crucifixion. There's no resurrection. 
things that do become similar, such as the the communal meal uh, of, that involves receiving uh, bread and wine and things like that. Justin Martyr is describing these things, but it's taking place in the second and third centuries. The Roman Mithra, the Roman Mithra, that stuff develops after Christianity. So the flow of copying is going in the direction. The same thing happens with Apollonius of Tyana. People will hear this from pe- from scholars like Bart Ehrman. They'll say, oh, Apollonius was a first century miracle worker who claimed to be the son of God and, P- and his disciples believed he rose from the dead. And it sounds really similar until you realize that Apollonius, the story of Apollonius was written, I believe, in the second or third century, several hundred years after Jesus to justify a temple that's being built to be a competitor to Christianity. So either the parallels are, are superficial or the copying is is going in the in the wrong wrong direction. Or and a lot of times, Keith, the when people try to point out the ones are just flat out false. Not just that they're superficial, but they're false. Like people will try to say the Egyptian god Horus was crucified. Uh, that, that just that never happened. Uh, that comes from amateur 19th century scholarship. Gerald Massey is a whole Gerald Massey is a one man source for bad Egyptology in this area, and it's been recycled by other people over the past 140 years. And so you just when when people bring this up to you, when they say, oh, this is copy from this, this is copy from that, you should ask the person, how what is your source, your primary source to show you these ancient religions predated Christianity and believed in these very specific things related to Christianity. And nine times out of 10, they can't give you a citation. They're just taking it on faith, reading from this anti-Catholic or anti-Christian author they're quoting from. That's that's absolutely huge, Trent. And I want all of my listeners to, to really hear what Trent is saying there. You guys, you can't just receive some anti-Catholic claim from somebody, no matter how confident they seem, no matter how eloquent they are, when they say something like this, you have to question it. And I remember for me, a huge moment in this was when I was learning, you know, about church history and, and world history and things. And I encountered the claim and I still I still encounter it probably every week, you guys, where someone wants to say the thing like the narrative, of course, is that early Christianity was, you know, a lot like what Protestantism looks like until Constantine made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire, and then blended all this stuff together to co-opt all these pagan myths, and then with his power to enforce this, to use it for political power. Friends, I'm just going to tell you an objective thing that I learned about this that blows that whole thing up was, of course, Constantine never did that. He didn't make Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. He just merely said that it was going to be tolerated so that People weren't going to be able to be killed for being a Christian. But that's two completely different things. Right. But yet people bring that claim as though that is central to this argument that it, uh, Constantine decreed that that this is now you have to be a Christian. Just like before, you had to be a pagan. Now you have to be a Christian. But but people, listen, you've got to question these things. And, and when you start to see this stuff fall apart— it should give you a pretty good indication that maybe some of the other things that you're being told as though they're objective truths really aren't true in the first place. And I think that's a huge difference that we have to understand right. is when someone is making an opinion claim, okay, there's or, uh, they're, they're describing their opinion. They're saying, well, I'm not really sure I can buy that versus, no, here's what happened. You know, Osiris, or who would you say, Horus or Osiris was crucified? Well- well, 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 people say that Horus, the Egyptian They'll god Horus, was crucified. They also say that Osiris, uh, well, well, they say that Osiris rose from the dead. Even though Osiris did not rise from the dead, his body parts were scattered all over Egypt. They were then reassembled so that he could rule in the underworld, uh, which is zombification. That's not glorious resurrected life. But you're right. You have to go back to all the sources and ask them specifically, where is this? So with the Constantine claim, that's very common. The idea that Constantine yeah. created Christianity, which you're right, that wasn't until under Emperor Theodosius at the end of the fourth century made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. But what takes the wind out of the sails of that thesis, and you see Jack Chick and other fundamentalists promoting this, what takes the wind out of the sails is they'll say confession to a priest, uh, the mass, the Eucharist, the Pope, uh, all of these things are just 
things that were done in paganism and then were uh, incorporated into Christianity by Constantine, you can find all of that stuff in the church fathers long before Constantine. Uh, the priest saying mass and, re and receiving confession of sins is explicit in, let's take uh, St. Cyprian, for example, over 100, you know, 100 years before Constantine. Even earlier than that, you read in Justin Martyr, Ignatius of Antioch. So one way to bust that myth, and people say, oh, Constantine invented this stuff, to say, hey, wait a minute, how did Constantine invent this and bring it into Christianity when you see the church fathers talking about it 100, 200 years earlier? Uh, in fact, there was a guy, Ralph Woodrow, he wrote a book called The Two Babylons. He tried to revive this guy, Alexander Hislop, who wrote a book on the the, the Babylonian, uh, the two Babylons, the idea that the Babylon, the, the evil woman in Revelation is the church and it's all pagan. And he, and he did this 19th century scholarship and it's horrendous. So Woodrow wrote a book defending it. And then later he did more research saying, wait a minute, this is all wrong. Hmm. Like that, wow. And so I think he called it Babylon Mystery Religion. And he wrote a second book recanting the first one when he actually looked into the historic details yeah i think that's that's huge and we we have to remember friends like we can't let someone hijack the narrative of where christianity came from without showing and we can show them the church fathers we can show them these things and say look this is this is the truth but what i find to be the case is that people tend to find what they're looking for Right. And if you've got a if you've got a Protestant who hates Catholicism and that just in their minds, there's no debate. It's just a closed idea that Catholicism is bad 100 percent. They're going to glob on to any kind of claim that sounds good, even though it might not even be true. They're not going to check it out. They're just going to receive it because they're just going to say, well, it has to be that way. I, and I remember when I was a Protestant trying to convert a buddy of mine who was Catholic, when I was trying to make him a Protestant, I would quote some of these things to them. And it wasn't because I had done all this work and read all these sources. It was just because, just because that's what I saw in a Jack Trick, Jack, uh, whatever chick. that guy's name, the Jack Chick Tract. That's hard to say. Yeah. Jack Trick the tracked. Chick Chick the Tracks. Chick tracks. Yeah. He's the most famous comic book artist in the world, I would, I think. He's oh, those little tracks. He's did you sold. ever see those when you were a kid? Like, did you? Did someone ever hand it, like put them on your like windshield at church or something like that? You're looking at oh, them. Yeah, and you're like, yeah. Uh, we yeah. have some good material at Catholic.com. We, uh, my friend Jimmy Aiken, wrote a whole little book just on those tracks, but they really do center in these kind of conspiracy theories. And Keith, once I met a Protestant pastor at a park who was passing them out, and I said, "You might want to get." better material than this it's really rife in conspiracy theories that like the jesuits are trying to take over the world or something like oh, that yeah. and he said your pope's a jesuit isn't he as if it was like some kind of a, a checkmate moment and i was like you have a good day here's here's my book why we're catholic hope pray that i pray that he reads it but <laughs> i i remember those i remember those those uh tracks and and books you know when i was a kid and I was, you know, my dad was a Methodist pastor. So we, you know, we weren't like fundamentalist anti-Catholics or anything like that. But yeah. I somehow got on this mailing list of some some apologetics group from California. And they were sending me these these like, you know, you know, line drawn pictures. And and it looked like some guy in his in his basement on a real typewriter and then Xerox the, the copy and, tr you know, turned it into a book. And there, one of them I got was it was like. Roman Catholicism and the cult of the Virgin Mary. And yeah. it was all of these things. And a lot of it had to do with like the cult of these ancient pagan goddesses, you know, and how, and I didn't know any different. I was just like, oh, okay. Well, I guess that must be true then because I wasn't coming from a place where I was really trying to do any research. I was just, you know, receiving what I was told. Right. And I think a lot of people, when they grow up in that, they don't think, that they should look into it. They just hear what they're told. And, and what I want to make sure everybody understands is because I know a lot of you guys out there are getting this type of material. I mean, because this whole idea came to me when someone sent me a message they had received from someone describing these arguments. And so I know this stuff's out there. I, I Guys, I want you to, you know, get Trent's books and look into these things. Look at look at some of the material from Catholic Answers and how they, they do such a great job of just presenting objective facts of what, and you can't argue with that. You can't say this wasn't what Christianity taught because you can look and see what the church fathers right. taught. But just remember, guys, you're always going to find people who hate the Catholic Church so much that they don't care about reality. They don't care about truth. What they care about is 
trying to save you from what they think the horrible, evil Catholic Church is. And yeah, you and don't I, have I to think, Right. And what's important is when you're talking to these people, sometimes it's not as helpful to say you're wrong and here's why, but to ask them, okay, so you're saying Catholicism came from this. How do you know that's true? How do you know they did believe this and that it did come from this? Where is your evidence for this? Because then when you that you can plant a little bit of seed of doubt in there, which can be more effective than just telling them they're wrong or getting angry with them and, and pointing that out. So, yeah, as, as I said before, you can note that the differences are, are superficial, but similar, or maybe they're really, really similar, but the facts are just totally wrong. In some cases, though, you may have uh, it could be a coincidental similarity. These things happen. For example, in 1898, there was a novel released about the world's most luxurious ocean liner that that struck an iceberg and sank in the middle of the ocean. And in the novel, the ocean liner was called the Titan. Wow. So, I mean, and that was that was 14 years before the Titanic sank. Did like, uh, this, this, Nostradamus write that or something? Well, it's it's way more accurate. <laughs> it's way closer than any of Nostradamus's original prophecies, but it's it, it's a coincidence there. So we, we have to you, you have to look at all of the the elements that are there and in a charitable way when engaging people uh, on these subjects. But another one that I do want to bolster once again, especially when we're talking to our Protestant friends or even our atheist friends, is that all religions are going to have some similar elements to them. Religion is just man's response to God. And so when human beings respond to God, even when you look at and you compare uh, Aborigine uh, religions or uh, I think John Danilu, the Catholic theologian, called them cosmic spirituality, they have similar elements to them. Like as a human being, you want to be awestruck at creation. Uh, you want to offer sacrifice to the deity you believe in. Like that's a universal human instinct. If you recognize God, and his goodness and grandeur, and you recognize your human lowliness, you want to offer something in return to the deity. So the fact that Christianity is built on the sacrifice of Christ and the mass is a presentation of that sacrifice, people will say, oh, look at the sacrifices and then paganism and this other stuff. Well, yeah, but that's a part of the human condition. We all want to turn back to God in some way. But Christianity has showed us the authentic and fullest way to be able to do that with the God-given intuition that, that we have. Yeah, I see. I kind of look at that stuff, Trent, as evidence, especially with atheists, okay? Not so much right. with Protestants, but with atheists, I look at that and I see that as a reason to believe in God because I, I think to myself, if 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 all that was true was just, you know, the natural reality that we can see, the material world, right? how do you account for the fact that throughout all of history and human civilization— there has been this concept of religion and this concept of creator, this concept of God. If there, it, it really ultimately serves no evolutionary purpose to believe in a, in a being that created you and in a, in a, in a being that, that wants you to sacrifice, because that's not very, you know, survival of the fittest ish to right. give of yourself. And, you know, you should be pushing your power on other people if that's true. So mm -hmm. where, where is the, and so when I see these similarities, even. And when I see this concept, I look at that and I go, you know, this is there because God put that on the human heart. It's built into what it means to be human, to know, to just look up at the sky and know that there's more to the universe, to us, than just what we can see with our right. eyes and, and feel with our senses. So to and me, that, I look at that and I go, that's a reason to, to believe in God. Right. So the similarities can be evidence of a common cause. Uh, C.S. Lewis called this myth become fact, that these stories of dying, rising gods, uh, while none of them are like Christianity because none of the gods die for sin and they don't rise to glorious immortal life, they're kind of stuck in a constant cycle of fall, winter, and spring with the crops. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it points towards that, that ultimate fulfilling truth. This also is helpful when we look at scripture, because some people will say, well, look, you've got elements of scripture that are stolen from other pagan myths. The most famous example of this would be the story of the flood in Genesis chapter six through eight. Yeah. And so people will say, look, that's just like the Epic of Gilgamesh. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a lone flood survivor. This is just a ripped off story. It's not divinely inspired. And the way we can respond to that is, well, actually, the Epic of Gilgamesh ripped it off from an older epic, the Epic of Atrahasis, 
So there's a lot of flood stories in Mesopotamia at this time. So if you have a lot of people describing a catastrophic flood and, and a single group of survivors, I would say that's evidence for some kind of a flood happening. And geologists have discovered very large ice dams in the Black Sea that 10,000 years ago, wherever the date is, if, if they collapsed, uh, they would have inundated the entire area and would and it would have made sense giving rise to flood narratives and things like that. But what I would say is, okay, you're right. There's there's superficial similarities here in that there's a giant flood and a few survivors, but there's core differences. So like in the Epic of Atrahasis, the gods flood the world because human beings are noisy and they can't stand them. It's just like I have a noisy neighbor <laughs> and there's multiple gods. But in Genesis, one god flood and the gods, by the way, in Atrahasis, they're scared of the flood. They run away from it. But in Genesis, God, singular, floods the world as an indictment of human sin. And but he had encouraged previously, very clear in Genesis, be fruitful and multiply. So the author of Genesis seems to be purposely subverting the anti-life uh, and polytheistic ideas of his pagan neighbors. So sometimes the borrowing is intentional to make fun of the competitors. And so uh, to give you an idea to understand this, uh, in Humani Generis, Pope Pius XII, so some people may, might say to me, oh, Trent, that's just modernist views of scripture, blah, blah, blah. You're, you know, you're, you're departing, you know, that's your proposed Vatican II modernism, blah, blah, you know. Well, no, in Humani Generis that was written, uh, you know, and I, it was like 1950, no, not 1950, but it was written before the Second Vatican Council. Pope Pius XII said, if, however, the ancient sacred writers have taken anything from popular narrations, and this may be conceded, it must never be forgotten that they did so with the help of divine inspiration, through which they were rendered immune from any error in selecting and evaluating those documents. So Pius XII says, yeah, they might have purposely borrowed from the competitors uh, to uh, when they were writing but as a way to show their deficiencies and the superiority in the true God who's revealed himself. Well, wouldn't it, wouldn't it make sense that if there was a worldwide flood that people from other parts of the world would have written something about it or had an idea of it or said something about it and incorporated that into their religious worldview? Well, well certainly, yes, especially if it were a global flood, you would definitely expect that. Uh, the church however, does not have a specific, uh, has not explicitly said how, uh, Christians are to interpret the flood. You could interpret it as a global inundation of the entire earth. Uh, you could also interpret it as a local flood that destroyed the world of the sacred writer, uh, that in scripture, the the earth or the, the land could refer to the entire area that the author knew. Either way, it would still have, if it, uh, one of those Black Sea dams collapsed, would have gone all the way through Mesopotamia. So either way, you're right. These The multiple accounts are evidence for it. And the the differences show the ancient author is, is subverting what's going on. And, and also to correct myself, I was right. Humanity Generous was written in, in 1950. I quick checked that. I was going to say something about that, Trent. Well, thank you. Thank you for. for... <laughs> I didn't know. Um, are they, OK, so I, I've and I've heard about the Epic of Gilgamesh thing. You know, I, I remember studying that in school. But are there any other things like that out there, too, where there we have multiple sources about the same type of event? No, I mean we have uh, different sources. I'm trying to think of one that would that would come to mind. What's interesting sometimes, though, is to contrast the the creation, uh, contrast these ancient myths. One I think is helpful is when you contrast Genesis to the other creation myths. Most creation myths are what are called cosmogonies. They usually describe the creation of the world as a byproduct of divine reproduction, the, the gods kind of hooking up with each other, or mm -hmm. as the byproduct of the gods engaging in war with each other. Uh, but in Genesis, it's just this, this single act of Yahweh, of God, uh, acting in a way to bring about the world from nothing by his own, by his own power. Uh, and then what's interesting, when you go further on in the Psalms, uh, you see uh, descriptions of of Yahweh fighting Leviathan. So, you know, so some atheists will read this and say that Yahweh crushed the head of the dragons. Like, oh, are you saying dragons exist? Well, no, it's like if I tell you that Jesus is stronger than Superman, is that true? Well, I ask you, is that true? Yeah, he is stronger than Superman. But that doesn't imply that Superman really exists. I'm just saying a lot of people like Superman. But guess what? I like Jesus. He's even stronger than Superman. And he's also real. 
So, you know, so when you you make these kinds of these kinds of comparisons to what other people in popular culture adore, it doesn't mean you're endorsing uh, what they believe in. And that's important remember, when we read through scripture and see the description of how Yahweh, these beings like the dragon or Leviathan uh, were supposed to be things that were like enemies of the ancient gods. In the Bible, they're described essentially as God's pets. He's not scared of them at, at all because he's not scared of anything. Yeah, I mean, you see things in the Old Testament about, you know, he is a God above all gods. You know, it doesn't mean there are other gods. It just means right. that people have this conception of of all these gods. And we're just saying that our God, the one true God, is above everything, even even above those other gods, which we're not. Again, it doesn't doesn't mean that we say they're real. Right. And so when the Israelites went into Canaan and they entered in there after the Exodus and went to Canaan into the promised land, uh, there came to be an identification that God had revealed his name as Yahweh. Uh, but when they entered Canaan, uh, God's name also came to be identified with El, E-L, uh, because in Canaan, El was the high God, the high deity of all the other gods. Because the Israelites are saying, oh, El is your your God above all the gods. Uh, he must be Yahweh then. We're talking about the same thing here because Yahweh is God above other gods. That's why the the chosen people who are God's chosen people are called Israel, uh, those those who struggle with God, with El. But to the recognition of that fact does not commit the ancient Israelites to some kind of polytheism or henotheism. Now, the ancient Israelites did struggle with idolatry. So sure. at least in the early stages of salvation history, they were tempted to worship other gods. God progressively revealed himself first as, look, I am the greatest of all the gods. And then at least by the time of Isaiah, if not earlier than that, you have the fullest that I am greater than these gods because there is no other God like me. Isaiah 4310, uh, all you know, the other passages there that clearly affirm biblical monotheism. Yeah, I mean, that's a slam dunk, I think, when you when you look at that to say, well, you know, ancient Judaism was polytheistic or whatever. I mean, no, that's that's not at all. But again, it goes back to looking at the facts, looking at objective things that are that are not just speculations, but, you know, the way people communicate with each other. You know, we sometimes look back, I think, at the scripture and we don't give people the ability just like to communicate the way that we all communicate today. Right. We think that, that everything in the scripture is like written down. And we want to be so biblical that we want to we want to take when we want to remove like hyperbole, we want to remove metaphors. We want to we want to. Oh, well, this, this, that we want to even remove sometimes exaggeration as though that right. means that there's error. When sometimes someone exaggerates as a way of communicating well, truth doesn't necessarily mean they're they're and wrong. We, and we live in a culture. It's important. And Pope Pius the Twelfth talks about this in his in his encyclicals like Providentissimus Deus and others on uh, interpreting scripture. We cannot import our culture back onto these ancient cultures when we're trying to understand them. For example, we live in a really exact culture. I mean, you and I, not only do we know what time it is, I know what time it is where you are, and you know what time it is where I am. We know how long that we have been talking. We know how many people live in the cities where we live through a sense, through an exact census. The ancient Israelites did not have that kind of exactitude, nowhere near it. And so they'll, they'll frequently use, it, like you said, exaggerated numbers, exaggerated language uh, in order to underscore the, the points that they're, that they're trying to make. So when we read uh, scripture, when we read through church history, read the church fathers, let them speak in their time and place and understand what they're asserting. And when you do that, you do see uh, parallels sometimes. Sometimes the author is comparing or contrasting with the surrounding culture. But then other times you see the superiority of either uh, what is revealed in the Old Testament or in the New, and you see its superiority to the surrounding culture and its uniqueness that ultimately comes from divine inspiration. Amen to that. Yeah, we got to be careful with stuff like that. I mean, I remember hearing people say things like, well, you know, the Bible says that a thousand years is like a day to the Lord. So that means that, you know, Anytime you see a day, that's a thousand years. And people start to do these weird countdowns in the Bible using these yeah. formulas where they've they hinge everything on their own reading of a, of 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 what was in the mind of the author yeah. when they wrote that. But, you got to read the whole thing because a, a yeah. day is a thousand years is what St. Peter is reflecting on to say, hey, look, the Lord is coming. We don't know when the judgment will be because God acts according to his own timetable. So, yeah, some people try to read that back into uh, Genesis chapter one. What are the length of the days? Uh, but the author of Genesis 1 doesn't seem to be writing his narrative 
in a chronological sequence. Because even at the time of St. Augustine, the Manichaean heretics said that the God of the Old Testament was this evil idiot, basically. They were saying the God of the Old Testament made the material world, which sucks. So don't worship him. He's evil. The God of the New Testament, who we really should be worshiping. And Augustine is saying, no, that's the same God. And the heretics would say to him, okay, he's but he's dumb. In Genesis, he makes the light on day one, but the sun on day four. Where does the light come from, smart guy? And Augustine says, well, he's not trying to write. It, the sacred author isn't writing in chronological order. He said, Augustine even said, the author has separated in time what God did in a single instant. So even, at, even back then, you had the church fathers and others defending against critics, making arguments that I, I find on atheist websites wow. today. Like, like I said, the same objections get recycled over and over and over again. There is nothing new under the sun. Ecclesiastes, yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I want to switch gears for a second here. And you mentioned Christmas trees earlier. Yeah. Another thing that, of course, you know, we just, we just, we're still in Easter season here, but we just, we always see these arguments around the time of Easter. Yeah. From our anti Catholic, you know, buddies who always want to say things like, oh, here we go again with all you, you know, Catholics who worship bunnies and eggs and Ishtar, you know, all of that garbage. And, this whole idea of certain things that we do with regard to holidays, you know, Christmas right. trees, Easter, you know, whatever it might be as being complete pagan in origin. And even still, some of them would say contemporary practice that whatever, that whatever we're doing with those things now is still pagan. I mean, how do, how do you respond to that? Right. So when we're talking with Protestant fundamentalist friends, there's actually others who go further than this. So Jehovah's Witnesses, for example, don't celebrate Christmas or Easter. Or birthdays. Yeah. Or birthdays. They don't celebrate birthdays. So you can say your Protestant fundamentalist friend who probably does celebrate Christmas and Easter, maybe not with the other accoutrements, uh, but I bet they probably celebrate people's birthdays. Yet the church fathers actually were very hesitant to celebrate birthdays. So that's why this comes up like, oh, you know, you know, celebrating when Christ was born. Uh, you know, was he born on December 25th? There's different arguments related to that. But the early church fathers were not as concerned about celebrating the day Christ was born because birthdays were more of a pagan celebration. The Bible only records two birthdays, Pharaoh celebrating Herod celebrating his birthday. So birthdays, so the Jehovah's Witnesses are on to something a little. If you're going to be a Protestant hmm. fundamentalist, you can't even celebrate birthdays because they really are a pagan element that Christians have come have come to baptize. So when you when you look at these other things that are brought up, you're right. A lot of times the, the facts are just completely wrong. The Easter Ishtar one is the most uh, explicit one one of that. It's so people will say that Easter is just a celebration of this Babylonian deity Ishtar, uh, who you know ha was a, a fertility figure, dying and rising to new life, things like that. The major problem with this is that. Calling the celebration of Christ rising from the dead Easter, that doesn't happen until the the early Middle Ages. The word because and in fact, in most languages today, like I go to a Byzantine Catholic church, we don't call it Easter. We call it Pascha or Paschal. In most other languages, Easter is called Pascha, Pascal, uh, because that, that references back to Christ being the Passover, the Paschal sacrifice. So Easter comes from Aoster which is a, a Germanic word that was developed centuries later. And so, and, and I love it. It's like, no, we, <laughs> on the meme, it says, it says, uh, uh, ish, you know, that we, we don't call it Ishtar. I've never met somebody who celebrates, the, you know, Christians who celebrate Ishtar. It's I, Easter. I never have either. It's Easter. Ishtar is not even connected with the bunny. She's connected with the lion and the six pointed star. All of the facts are, are just wrong. She goes down to the underworld, uh, then is rescued. And I think her brother, husband or sister, I forget which one, ends up going down to the underworld in her place over and over again, which once again goes back to the, the seasonal cycle. Uh, the Easter bunny is interesting because that one is derivative of the, it comes from the Easter hare, H-A-R-E, that was celebrated that that Lutherans came up with this uh, after the process. Yes. You're kidding me. This was a, the Lutherans started that those stinkers. Yeah. They, well, they, they said the Easter hare was it's kind. He was kind of like elf on the shelf. 
that the Easter hare was this bunny who would see if children were good uh, during the Easter season, and then they would be rewarded afterwards. And so that's where it, uh, you know, where where it began. It was kind of just like Christians today might do Elf on the Shelf. Doesn't mean we believe this Elf exists or it's part of our. It's just something that was that that's uh, that was incorporated uh, in, into the story, but it, it has nothing to do uh, with with the original proclamation of Easter or anything like that. It's it's something that's fun, and we can impose images on you know springtime, new life. We have our ultimate new life in Christ. We look backwards and see these things, but they were not the source of the original belief, which was grounded in the historical reality of Christ's resurrection. Yeah, I think that's just hilarious. I didn't know that thing about the Lutherans and the and the hair, you know. But yeah. it's, it's so it's so funny how people just spout this stuff off like they know that it's true, and they know that that there's this big conspiracy. I mean, the whole Ishtar Easter thing, like because it kind of sounds the same, you know, Ishtar Easter, <gasps> you know, and it's almost like you've discovered this truth where. Now we got you, you know, and I think a lot of it is sort of like that gotcha idea with with Christianity. But, where it's, it's, like, but it's so ah. silly. It's so silly when you have to remind people that English has not been the universal language for humanity for all of history. It's yeah, like but, it's like when mythicists say, wait a minute, Jesus is the son of God and Egyptians worshipped the son, <gasps> S-U-N. They sound the same. Well, you're right, but in Egyptian, the word sun, S O N and S U N, sound nothing alike. So you when people try to find this, it, they're they're taking a very intellectually lazy way to try to make these comparisons. Well, a lot of these guys are the same ones that are like, hey, if the King James was good enough for Paul, it was good enough for me. You know? Yeah. Thankfully, they're in a very, very small minority, those who would think that you're right. There's some people who think the King James version of the Bible is the only inspired word of God and a even more radical fringe who would think that the only inspired word of God is the English King James version that has yeah. been around for 2000 years inexplicably. But it's, um, but I mean, there are others who um, will, will take this even in the Catholic world. They'll try to elevate um, the Vulgate, for example, to say that it's some kind of super translation of the scriptures, even though the church does not have an official translation. The Vulgate has a pride of place in the history of the church. Uh, but nowadays we have discovered more manuscripts uh, to be able to help us, like like there's people who read the Douay Rheims. It's a it's a wonderful translation, but it does have its its deficiencies that that other newer translations have been able to to amend. But I don't need to open up more of a can of worms unnecessarily. Well, yeah, I mean now you got me thinking because when I became a Catholic, I thought, all right, like the hardcore Catholics read the Douay Rheims, you know, because that's like the you know the Vulgate was the official, you know. Bible translation from Latin. So, so it's not the official one. I didn't know that. I didn't well, the, know. Yeah, the, the church does not have currently an, an official translation of the Bible. There are a variety of translations that are used that have uh, different varying qualities to them. I find there's uh, elements of the Dewey Rames that are very beautiful in their prose and that put forward theological truths in a very explicit way that I do enjoy. Uh, but there's going to be other way, other ways that they've been articulated that because language changes over time, uh, you're going to you're going to lose the meaning of it with with other audiences. If you don't know what suffer the little children to come to me, like, well, what, what does that mean? We don't we don't we don't talk like that anymore. And then, um, so like like when I'm studying, for example, uh, the translation that I enjoy using the most would probably be the revised standard version Catholic edition. So when you look at biblical translations, there's two philosophies, uh, formal and dynamic. Formal would be, all right, I'm going to try to pick the English word that most corresponds to the ancient Hebrew or Greek. And, you know, I'm trying to get word for word. Mm -hmm. The dynamic translation tries to get idea for idea. Yeah, we so call like, it thought for thought. So word for word or thought for thought, you know. Exactly. And yeah. so there's there's benefits uh, uh, between them. Like the New American Bible, which is typically read in the liturgy, is more thought for thought because you're reading it in public liturgies, things like that. The RSV is more word for word along it. And so there's going to be a spectrum, obviously. So at the far end of thought for thought is a paraphrase Bible like the message, which is not a Bible. Right. That's not reliable for anything. Uh, on the other hand would just be a literal trend is just you took the Greek and you put the English words on them. 
but that would be so difficult to read. And also you wouldn't get what you're reading. For example, in the Old Testament, it says that God is long of nose. It's like, well, what is like to praise God? Oh, you Lord, you are long of nose. What that and so what we translate it nowadays, we translate that slow to anger. Because in uh, ancient Israel, the people who were the most patient and the people who were who acted calmly and weren't rash were the elders in the community. And you could tell they were older because as you get older, the cartilage in your nose and your ears uh, gets weaker and it starts to droop. That's why people like sometimes say, you know, when you're older, your nose gets bigger. It doesn't get bigger. The cartilage droops more because it loses its strength. So when the Bible says God is long of nose, it means he's slow to anger like the elders in our community, yet even more so than them. So there's an idea. Some people say, oh, I don't want thought for thought. I'll just do word for word. But if you're not from the culture, you're, you're, you're going to miss it unless someone points these things out to you. Exactly. And I think and I think that's kind of, you know, the theme here to what we were talking about with all this paganism stuff too, Trent. Right is a lot of these arguments require that we import our cultural ideas and understandings on on some things that are objectively real and true, like some things about, you know, like you talk about um, Horace was, he was killed, but his body parts were scattered, right? He wasn't risen from the dead like Jesus Christ in, in their mythology. Of course, none of that really true, right? Yeah. Oh, well, Osir Osiris's body is scattered. Osiris, yeah. Or sorry. Horus is resurrected from a, a, he's brought back to life from a, after a scorpion bite. So. Yeah. So, <laughs> but, but what we're saying is what people do is they take these ideas that we have now and the way we talk now and the way we think now, and then they, they pull, place that over the top of these of these mythological ideas or whatever, and then say, now we've got a comparison. Therefore, Catholicism equals paganism. Right. It's a really, really horrible way to do right. you know, biblical understanding, science, right. apologetics, whatever you want to call it. It's just, right. you know, so yeah, I think, I think we have to be, and here's where this ultimately lines up for me mm -hmm. is we have to be, more willing to embrace the truth, more willing to go into the direction of, of what is real, not bury our heads in the sand and just receive a jack trick, click track, chick track, you know, all that stuff. We have to look and, and your, your point earlier about, hey, how do you know that? Right. You know, what are your sources? So I guess that's that's really, really the bottom line. Trent, I, this has been a fantastic conversation. I've, I've really enjoyed it. Um, you know, like I said before, you're were, you were a guy that has really meant a lot to me in my own uh, studies over the years um, as I came into the church. And even since then, more so, really, honestly, <clears throat> because when I converted, it was like now now everybody wants to bring all these arguments to me and, and do all these things. And, and and a lot of times I've looked towards your material as a way to to answer people. So I want to thank you for your work with that. And just can you let, let our audience know a little bit more about what you've got going on, what you have? Um, in store and where people can find out more about you? Sure. Uh, so I have a my own podcast, The Council of Trent. Uh, that's available on iTunes and Google Play. Uh, I do three episodes a week there, and it's also available on YouTube at our Council of Trent YouTube page. So I do that during the week. Uh, I also have uh, several books that I've written. Uh, those are available um, online, wherever you can get good Catholic books. Uh, and you can always find a lot more of my work also at Catholic.com. Uh, but I'm doing a lot of work with the podcast right now. So definitely encourage your listeners to check out the Council of Trent, either on iTunes, Google Play, uh, or on YouTube. And they can become premium subscribers, get access to bonus content at TrentHornPodcast.com. Awesome. And yeah, I mean, it's that's a, that's a must listen to. If you're a person into apologetics, you want to learn about your faith, you know, the, the Council of Trent is something that you, you just have to subscribe to that and and listen to it. For me, I listen to it when I'm traveling, when I'm when I'm doing different things, because you know your your episodes aren't like three hours long, <laughs> and like really really. The, you, you get to the point. You talk about really important things, and I I appreciate that. Well, once again, Trent, let me uh, express my thanks to you for being here, and um, just let you know that you're appreciated. Your work is is um, it's accomplishing many things. I had I had some friends of mine recently who had been a part of the church I used to be at before I became a Catholic. And they contacted me and said, Hey, we're thinking about becoming Catholic. I was completely blown away. And they came over to the house. We talked and I gave, I gave them a copy of your book, why we're Catholic. 
and they joined this this year at the Easter wow. Vigil. It was, it was awesome, and I know that was a very helpful thing to them. So thank you for that. Praise be to God. Hey, guys, thank you so much for watching. Be sure to check out Keith's channel and go to his website, downtoearthministry.org. I think he has a lot of great content. You definitely should go and check it out. And then be sure to click subscribe so that you get all the new content that we're going to be putting out there, and you can help the channel grow and spread. So, hey, thank you guys so much, and I hope you have a very blessed day. Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you want to help us produce more great content like this, be sure to click subscribe and go to trenthornpodcast.com to become a premium subscriber. You'll help us create more videos like this and get access to bonus content and sneak peeks of our upcoming projects.